Right. Hello and uh, welcome everybody to our webinar in the series Understanding Sobornost. This webinar is hosted by the School of Theology and Religious Studies at the University of Tartu. My name is Irina Pert and um, I'm um, co-hosting this webinar with Andrei Shishkov. So this webinar is um, uh, carried out in the framework of a research project that is called Orthodoxy as Solidarity, an examination of op popular and conciliar orthodoxy in Estonia during the long 20th century. So you can follow our activities on the uh, web page, uh, the name of which will be uh, visible in subtitles, I hope. So let us start and Andrei, please introduce our speaker today. Hello, everybody, uh, dear colleagues. Uh, I'm glad to introduce our speaker, uh, Paul Valier, uh, Emeritus Professor of Religion at Butler University, in Indianapolis, United States. Professor Valier, very well known uh, for his studies in Russian Orthodox theology and religious thought. In uh, 2000, uh, he uh, published a monograph on modern Russian theologians, uh, Fyodor uh, Bukharev, uh, Vladimir Solovyov, and Father Sergei Bulgakov. In um, uh, 2012, uh, uh, was published his uh, uh, fundamental work on conciliarism, this one, uh, a history of decision making in the church. Uh, and uh, the last project of uh, Professor Valier is an editing of the collective monograph Law and the Christian Tradition in Modern Russia. It is a project uh, in Emory uh, uh, University. And uh, as I understand, it is coming soon. Uh, today, uh, Professor Valier uh, will speak about uh, subordinates in the discourse uh, of the Russian church in the second half of uh, 19th and early 20th uh, centuries. Um, let's start our uh, uh, seminar and uh, Paul, please. Uh, Thank you very much, um, Andre. And, uh, Special thanks to both you and Irina for the invitation to present uh, here in the webinar and to participate in this wonderful research project. It's a very timely and very substantive research project on Orthodox perspectives on subornos. Um, we need a lot more work on this subject and I'm very excited to uh, be part of it. I greatly enjoyed the presentations that we've already had by Father Lauf and uh, Father Kirill. Last time, um, I hope I can um, continue our discussion in as interesting a way today. Uh, I've prepared a paper, uh, let me read it. I will try to um, speak uh, slowly and clearly uh, and um, am looking forward to our discussion. In my presentation today, I'm going to focus on how the concept of subornos served as a principle of church criticism in Russia from the period of the great reforms in the 1860s and 70s to the church reform movement of the first two decades of the 20th century. I will also point out, however, that it was possible to interpret Kamyakov's ecclesiology in a way that was not fundamentally sympathetic to the direction taken by the church reform movement. Sobornos became a principle of church criticism when its advocates turned away from apologetics directed against the West and examined their own Orthodox church. What happened when people looked for Sobornos in the ecclesiastical reality of 19th century Russian orthodoxy. Did they find it? Did sobornos, that is to say, fellowship, solidarity, describe the character, the texture, the dynamics of church life in Russia at the time? And when I say church life, I am speaking concretely about the institutional structures of the church the episcopate, the clergy, the laity, the parishes, the eparchies, and the central church administration. 
were those institutions functioning in such a way as to nurture and communicate subornos? The critics answered in the negative. No, they said, our ecclesiastical status quo does not embody, does not radiate subornos. Let me give you some examples. I begin with Alexei Nikolaevich Muravyov. Muravyov was a contemporary of Hamyakov's and resembled him in many ways. He was a nobleman who following a brief military career became a kind of lay theologian. Unlike Hamyakov, however, Muravyov worked for a number of years as a senior secretary in the bureaucracy of the Holy Synod. So he knew the synodal system from the inside. What is important about Muravyov for our purposes today is that he was one of the first advocates for the restoration of councils in the Russian church. In the 1850s and 60s, Muravyov wrote confidential memoranda to successive general procurators of the Holy Synod proposing the restoration of bishops' council. None of those memoranda were published at the time. In 1883, however, a decade after Muravyov's death, an edited version of one of them was published in Ruski Archiv. The article makes interesting reading in light of the emergence of Sobornos discourse. The term subornus does not appear in the article because Muravyov's vocabulary took shape long before the invention of the neologism by Nikita Gilyarov Platonov in 1867. But in Muravyov's ideas, one can see the beginnings of the critique of Russian ecclesiastical reality that would soon operate under the banner of subornus. Muravyov was highly critical of the Episcopal leadership of the church of his day. The heart of his complaint was not that the bishops were tyrants of the church, nor did Muravyov question the principle of Episcopal government as such. His complaint, it was a lament really, was that the bishops of his day lived and worked in a kind of isolation. They enjoyed little fellowship with their flock or even with each other because they never got together. They never assembled as a body. Indeed, they rarely saw each other. He observes, for example, that the eparchy of Moscow headed, uh, headed of course, by the Metropolitan, bordered at the time on seven other eparchies which formed a circle around the city. We might speak of an eparchial calso, if you will, governed by seven bishops. But, Muravyov lamented, nikamu iz archiereyev ne prihodit na mysl pasitit stolitsu. It never enters the head of any of the bishops to, public, to visit the capital, that is to say, to visit the capital for consultation with the metropolitan and with each other. And the same kind of isolation afflicted the episcopate throughout the Russian church. The result of this nedostatic obscenia, this lack of interaction, Muravyov observed, was that the bishops suffered from adinochestva, loneliness or isolation, minitilness, suspiciousness, and the deficiency of obscitilness, basic sociability. Muravyov saw the resumption of episcopal councils as a means of building up the fellowship of the episcopate and of the church. Let me turn to another church critic, Nikita Gilyarov Platonov, who, as we know, was the man who invented the term subornos when he translated Kamyakov's French theological essays into Russian in 1867, seven years after Kamyakov's death. Gilyarov was 20 years younger than Kamyakov and having been born and educated in the clerical Soslovia, he came from a completely different social stratum. In the mid 1850s, Gilyarov taught briefly at Moscow Theological Academy, but he left after incurring the displeasure of Metropolitan Philorath. In the 1860s, he became a full-time journalist 
And in 1867, the same year as the Homyakov translations, Gilyanov became the founding editor of the first daily newspaper published in the city of Moscow, Sovremienia Izvestia. This in itself is a fascinating fact that suggests how committed Gilyanov was to promoting obscenia, interaction, social communication, and dialogue in Russian society. The newspaper was comprehensive, but Gilyanov contributed many articles discussing church issues. Gilyanov did not often use the term sobornost in his journalism, although he constantly advocated for the resumption of conciliar practice in the church. In an essay titled On the Necessity of a Church Council, he argued that councils were the best way to address all kinds of misunderstandings and problems in the church. He also promoted the resumption of pan-Orthodox conciliarism as the best means of addressing conflict in what we now call global orthodoxy. As one might expect, his prime example, he was writing in 1871, was the bitter dispute between the ecumenical patriarchate and the Bulgarian church communities of the Ottoman Empire. One essay where Gilyadov explicitly uses the term sobornos is entitled of Lassi Episcopal on the power of bishops. In it, he sets out to evaluate the claims of some churchmen in Russia at the time that bishops should enjoy polnovlastia, that is to say, a monopoly of power in the Orthodox Church. The context of the discussion was the effort to revise the church court system in the Russian Empire. I'm not going to talk about that right now. We can talk about it later if you wish. What's interesting here for our purposes is Gilyadov's analysis of power, vlast, in the Orthodox Church. He begins by saying that the concept of power as such should have no place in the church. It represents the transference of an idea appropriate to the state into the realm of the church, which should be a spiritual realm based on bonds of love and voluntary assent. Now, this might suggest that Gilyadov was not fundamentally concerned with the institutional structures of the church. But that would not be correct. He was very concerned with institutional structures. What he wanted was institutional forms that actually embodied and communicated ecclesial values. In this essay, he criticizes orthodox theorists of Episcopal authority who argue that while bishops are indeed plenipotentiaries, polnovlasnia, in their eparchies, they are not plenipotentiaries in relation to each other because in theory, at least, they must defer to the will of a council of bishops and that this conciliarism is what distinguishes Orthodox Sobornos from Roman Catholic church government. Gilyadov viewed this way of construing Sobornos as insufficient. If the only difference between Orthodox and Roman church government is that in Rome, one bishop exercises polnovlastia, while in the Orthodox church, a council of bishops exercises it, then the difference between the two systems is not so great. Rome simply has a singular papacy, while Orthodoxy has a collective papacy. But is this what Sobornos means? Gilyadov said no. He wanted the principle of Sobornos to be, and I quote, applied to the whole company of believers, which is an even fuller Sobornos. The idea that Sobornos should encompass, quote, not bishops alone, but all believers, bishops included, received systematic elaboration in the outline of a reformed system of Russian church government authored by Alexander Mikhailovich Ivansov Platonov and published in 1882 
in a series of articles in Ivan Aksakov's newspaper, Rus, under the title, Atserkovnom Upravlenini, on church government. Ivan Sov was a priest who in 1872 was invited by the rector of Moscow University, Sergei Solovyov, to teach church history there. Ivan Sov was also close to Sergei Solovyov's son, Vladimir, who of course, would soon become the leading religious philosopher of 19th century Russia. Ivansov tried to imagine how the Sabornaya Natshala, as he usually calls it, the conciliar principle, could be institutionalized on every level of the church. Let me give you an example. Ivansov proposed that bishops, instead of being appointed by the central church administration, should be elected by an assembly of their eparchy. He envisioned an assembly composed of three elements. First, a representative of the central church administration. Second, representatives of the clergy of the eparchy. And third, representatives of the local laity. Each of the three parties would have the right to nominate a candidate for the office of bishop, and each party would have one vote, so that the total number of votes possible in an electoral assembly was three. The candidate who received at least two of the three votes would become the bishop. Ivansov made room for minority opinion, however. In his design, if the minority party had strong objections to the choice made by the majority, the case would be submitted to the central governing synod of the national church. If the synod unanimously affirmed the minority's choice, the election would be annulled and a new election would be held. If on the other hand, the central synod's opinion was divided, then the majority choice of the eparchial assembly would prevail. In making this proposal, Ivansov reminded his audience that in the ancient church, bishops were indeed elected, so that his proposal should be seen as the restoration of a traditional practice. At the same time, of course, we can see that Ivansov's scheme was also quite modern. This combination of appeals to ancient practice with modern institutional procedures was typical of the proposals made by the church critics. Let me mention some other features of Ivansov's scheme. Uh, first, he proposed that the governing body of an eparchy should be an eparchial assembly composed of clerical and lay deputies under the presidency of the bishop. These assemblies would be consultative bodies, savishchatelnia. The Episcopal president would remain the final decision maker. However, because the bishop would make his decisions in a conciliar context, after listening to the voices of the deputies and weighing their advice, and because, as we have seen in Ivansov's scheme, bishops would have been elected by their eparchies in the first place, Ivansov believed that bishops would make decisions that reflected the conciliar consensus, the common mind of their church. On the national level, the supreme governing body would be the local council. All governing bishops would be members of the council, but they could also bring presbyters, deacons, and lay persons to the sabor and these helpers would have the right to participate fully in the Sabor's discussions. This inclusiveness was necessary, Ivansov argues, for purposes of a fuller realization of the idea of the church. Voting, however, would belong to the bishops alone as in the ancient councils. Ivansov envisioned the local council as a periodic, not an extraordinary assembly. The Sabor would gather at least once every three to five years. 
extraordinary meetings could also be held as necessary to respond to particular needs. Periodicity of councils is crucial, of course, if they are to function as the governing body of a church. If the local council meets only when a special need arises, then responsibility for governing the church will lie elsewhere, such as in a permanent elite synod. What I find striking about Ivansov's proposals is how similar they are to the system of church government that was actually instituted by the great All-Russian Sabor of 1917-18. Before we get to that point, however, I need to mention another development that was crucial to the making of the church reform movement, namely the rise of the critical study of Orthodox canon law in Russia. The church critics I've presented so far today, Muravyov, Gilyarov, Ivansov, all appealed from time to time in their writings to the canons of Orthodoxy but their appeals were brief and limited. These men were not authorities on Orthodox canon law. Beginning in the 1860s, however, in other words, at roughly the same time as the rise of the church critics, the scholarly study of canon law began to be cultivated seriously in Russian universities and theological academies. This development was not connected with Homiakovian ecclesiology or with the discourse of Sobornos at the beginning, but the canonists' work had profound implications for church reform, first of all, because it demonstrated how chaotic the application of church law actually was in Russia at the time, indeed, how chaotic it had been throughout the synodal period and perhaps even earlier. The term chaotic is not my word. I'm quoting Alexei Pavlov, one of the greatest of the modern Russian canonists. In the concluding paragraph of the first half of his greatest work, Kurs Tserkovna Prava, A Course of Church Law, Pavlov repeats the word chaotic five times, five times in one paragraph to describe the condition of Russian church law in his day, the 1890s, going on to say that this chaos was the reason why the critical study of Orthodox law was so necessary. Thanks to the pioneering work of Pavlov and the other modern Russian canonists, when the church reform movement emerged in the context of the general crisis of the Tsarist state in the early years of the 20th century, the Russian Orthodox community was not only prepared for a public discussion of Sobornos, it was also prepared for a public discussion of Kananichnos, canonicity. Sobornos and Kananichnos together became the watchwords, the passwords, the themes of the church reform movement. The two concepts complemented each other very well even though they sprang from different sources. Perhaps I can put the complementarity in the following way. Kananichnus pertains to the laws of the church. Sobornus is the spirit of the laws. L'esprit des lois, to use the wonderful phrase from Montesquieu. The connection between the two was not arbitrary, but substantive, not utilitarian, but intimate. Sobornos and Kananichnos came together in a practical working relationship in the Preconciliar Commission, the Predsobornoya Prisutstvia of 1906, a commission which Günter Schulz has called a mini council. This is a good way to describe the Preconciliar Commission because while the canonists were the most vocal members, they were the experts after all, the context in which they found themselves was not a university lecture hall or academic symposium, but 
a mixed body of bishops, clergy, and laity charged with planning the first council of the Russian church in more than two centuries. Their work, along with subsequent follow-up efforts, was the main reason why the Russian church was able to convoke a local council so quickly after the fall of the Tsarist regime in 1917, the plans had already been made. To be sure, some features of the all Russian support differed from the scheme adopted by the Preconciliar Commission, but the continuity between the two is by far the weightier fact. It is certainly appropriate to think of 1917 as a year of emergency, a year of upheaval and improvisation in the Russian state and Russian society. But one should not think of the great Sabor of that year as an improvised assembly called on short notice and lacking a clear vision of what it was to do. In substance, if not in its timing, the all Russian Sabor was the fruit of a process of deliberation and maturation that began a half century earlier during the great reforms. To be sure, there were disagreements as to how Sobornost and Kanonichnost should be put into practice. For example, while there was a broad consensus that lay persons should play a role in the local council, there was controversy over how that role should be construed. Should the lay members of the council have a deciding vote or just a consultative vote? In 1917, however, a way was found to synthesize the conflicting views so that the conflict did not inhibit or subvert the council. A kind of bicameralism was employed to structure the council in such a way that all members, laity included, had a deciding vote in the council's general assembly, while the special role of the episcopate was preserved by providing for an episcopal assembly with the right to reject decisions made by the general assembly. A right, however, that had to be exercised according to a due process spelled out in the rules of the Sabor. This compromise produced a result that was not unlike Ivan Sof Platonov's vision of 1882, a comprehensive assembly bringing all estates of the church together while reserving the final determination to the episcopate, a decision-making authority, however, that bishops would exercise not as plenipotentiary, but as participants, participants in the conciliar process. Now, in my presentation up to this point, I've focused on how Sabor, uh, Sabornos as a critical principle inspired church reform discourse in Russia. It was possible, however, to embrace the idea of Sabornos without necessarily embracing the movement for structural reform in the church. The phenomenon I'm touching on here actually began with Hamyakov himself. As we know, Hamyakov's writings on the Saborni character of the church were not extensive. Furthermore, to my knowledge, and please correct me if I'm wrong, some of you know this history much better than me, Hamyakov himself never called for a council. He preached an ecclesial spirituality that many readers, like our own uh, colleague, Father Andrew, have rightly connected with the Eucharistic fellowship of the church, but he did not call for subords, at least not explicitly. The possibility of embracing subornos without calling for the resumption of conciliar practice existed throughout the period I am discussing. Let me give you an example closely connected with Hamyakov. As some of you know, Alexei Stepanovich's son, Dmitry Alexeyevich Hamyakov, was one of the 35 members of the Preconciliar Commission of 1906. 
one might think then in Dmitri, we have a good example of his father's legacy at work in the church reform movement. But this is not the case. First of all, Dmitri Hamyakov never attended any of the meetings of the Preconciliar Commission, not one. I am not in a position to research the reasons for his absence. Perhaps they were accidental, perhaps some of you know. What I have done, and so can you, is to read the short monograph that Dmitry Alekseevich published in 1906, in which he assessed the church reform movement of the time. The title of the piece is Sobornoya Zavrashenia i Prihadskaya Asmova Cerkovnova Stroya, the conciliar culmination and parish basis of the structure of the church. If you read it, you will see that Dmitry Alekseevich did not really sympathize with the project of structural church reform. His monograph propounds a romantic religious populism. He believed that the problems of the church would be solved if the common folk in the parishes practiced more fervent prayer. And to that end, he argued, the Russian people needed more effective pastors, not however, pastors in the mold of seminary graduates. His hero was Father John of Kronstadt, Essentially, what Homyakov says in this essay is that if there were more Father Johns in the church, more charismatic preachers of orthodoxy at the grassroots level, church renewal would happen without formal structural change. He did not even believe in the necessity of a local council because he observed subornos can flourish and in old Russia often did flourish in the absence of conciliar practice. In other words, one can have subornos without subornos. The tendency to minimize the importance of councils in the cultivation of subornos in the church went hand in hand with skepticism about the direction of the church reform movement in Russia and about the all Russian sabor of 1917-18 in particular. These doubts were often expressed by theologians in the emigration who accused the reform movement of falling into a kind of constitutionalism in the church. I can give you examples later on. Criticism of the church reform movement for proposing a kind of constitutionalism in the church, however, appeared early Already in 1882, in his essay on church government, Ivansov felt compelled to assure his readers that we not nadobnosti želat pravedenje v našem eparhialnom upravljenju kakih nebuds konstitucionnih ili demokratičskih načal. That is to say, we see no necessity to want to introduce into our system of diocesan administration any sort of constitutional or democratic principle." End quote. An interesting discussion of this complaint about constitutionalism in the church can be found in Sergei Bulgakov's historiosophical work, Napiru Bagov, At the Feast of the Gods, which appeared in 1918 in the Zbornik is Glubini. Let me conclude my talk with a point about this discussion, which dates, of course, uh, from the period of the Sabor itself. In Bulgakov's work, six fictional interlocutors dialogue with each other concerning the destiny of Russia in light of the revolutionary upheaval of 1917-18. In the final dialogue, there is a discussion of the All-Russian Sabor. A writer says to a lay theologian and participant in the Sabor, quote, up to now, the Sabor has been operating as an ecclesiastical constituent assembly, elaborating a kind of constitution. This, of course, is necessary because we have to clean out 
centuries old Augean stables, but to pass here is a kind of ecclesiastical cadetism, a constitutional democratic orthodoxy. And to tell you the truth, I have fears about this purely legalist orthodoxy. It would be very easy for a new clericalism to build a nest in it, a most dangerous sort of clericalism. And I wonder whether we will scrub our orthodoxy clean to such a polish that we rub out not just crude black hundredist religiosity, but also the ancient piety we hold so dear. But now listen to how the lay theologian and participant in the Sabor replies to these fears expressed by the writer. Such a worry as yours, he says, can only arise from the periphery, from outside the atmosphere of the council. More important and more essential than all the actual business of the council is the spirit of ecclesiality there, our actual incorporation into the life of the church. What a joy it is to sense the full reality of ecclesial interaction, the full power of the conciliar union of all elements of the church, the episcopate, the clergy, and the laity. We have no reason to fear ecclesiastical juridicalism. This reply comes very close to saying what I was trying to say a few minutes ago in my comments on Kananichnas and Sobornos. Certainly, if one examines the structure of the Sobor of 1917-18 and the church structures legislated by the Sobor, without considering the animating principle of the reform movement, one might conclude that the reform movement ended in a kind of legalism. If, on the other hand, we remember the animating principle of the movement, that is to say, sobornos, fellowship, solidarity, then we will see that besides composing laws, the great council embodied the spirit of the laws. In a word, the sobor embodied sobornos. Those are my remarks. And I invite your discussion. Andre, I think you're in charge of it. Thank you, Paul. Wow, amazing. Uh, a lot of thoughts and uh, very interesting tension between subordinates as church integrity and subordinates as uh, some kind of church parliamentarism. Um, and now I would like to invite the participants of the seminar to ask their questions. Please raise your hands virtually or really. And uh, the first question from uh, Dan Scarsborough. Hi, thanks very much. Um, really interesting, Paul. I think that what you're talking about, this uh, concern, well, a lot of the things that you're talking about, the, the connection between Kananichnast and Sobornast, and the concern over subordinate becoming parliamentarianism is, uh, is really discussed intensely at the Vsiarasiski Siezd Duchavienstva in Miryan, which preceded the Sabor in Moscow. And this is, of course, the culmination of a lot of these revolutionary uh, Siezdi that happened throughout the, uh, throughout the province, throughout the diocese. In, uh, in 1917. And th this, in my research, I see this as a recurrent concern that the, um, the parish clergy want, want uh, more, want broader participation, but they're, they're worried that uh, 
they're worried about another element, which is apostolic authority. I think this is another element in what is subordinate and what does uh, what what role does apostolic authority play in that? Uh, what who has the vote when you have this eventual council? And uh, it, so the 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 parish clergy want it to be more more inclusive, but they're worried that if it becomes too inclusive. If they degrade the apostolic authority of the episcopate too greatly, then their own authority will will be degraded among the laity. So there there were comments like, the these radical priests are sawing off the branch on which they sit is is one one uh, comment that I heard, and uh, uh, at in the uh, the 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 council this the council that's preceded the sabor. Bulgakov was there as well, and Bulgakov made these comments that uh, that we we may we're in danger of replacing uh, the idolatry of the uh, of the tsar with the idolatry of of democracy. That we shouldn't go too far uh, in in that direction as well. And so, and I actually found in one in and uh, sorry, I'm I'm all over the place with my thoughts here. Saborna uh, kananichnost. Uh, I, I saw that that comment uh, um, made by um, anyway I'll find that later I'll come I'll come back to it but <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah I, I guess those are my comments for now. <laughs> well, you remind us that first of all, there's an extraordinary amount of material to examine mm -hmm. that's relevant to the discussion we're having. Uh, there was just such an explosion of activism and discourse uh, about the church and in the church uh, in the period from 1905 to 1917 that um, you know, it, it, one, um, you know, one has to decide uh, how, how much of that material you can actually integrate because it's all relevant. Uh, mm -hmm. And you're quite right uh, to uh, cite that assembly. Uh, the it, what I find interesting um, in an earlier publication uh, that hasn't appeared yet, I, I I make the comment that the process of the church reform movement from the late 19th century to the Great Council of 1917-18 was a process that would gratify a good Hegelian, and what I mean by that is something purely metaphorical, but the idea is that if you look at those decades of activism and discourse, you see these tremendous tensions, not to say conflicts between different parties in the church and different ways of viewing what subordinates really means, what communist really means. You see these tensions and conflict, but nevertheless, the council happened and it it put together a church constitution which reconciled uh, these opposites it did not in the end opt for a democratic church polity the system of church government of the council preserved ultimate episcopal authority in the church. That is not a democratic constitution. It's an Episcopal constitution uh, uh, with its, its foundation in, in uh, canon law. Uh, so even though the council gets accused of democratism, for example, that's you know, the most extreme of the uh, accusations, uh, if you actually look at the system it put in place, it was not a democratic system, uh, nor did the most democratic uh, uh, factions in the church uh, call the shots at the council. The end result was a rather remarkable synthesis of uh, that emerged out of these antagonisms. Again, which is why I say there's a, a kind of Hegelian beauty <laughs> to what uh, to the story I'm uh, telling here. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Paul. Uh, uh, who will be the next? Uh, Father Kirill, please. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you, Paul, for your wonderful presentation and, uh, and especially for your clear distinction between subornist and sabore and consuls. They are not necessarily connected with one another. It was a very good point, and I think it's very helpful indeed. Um, also, what was helpful uh, is the parallel, I believe, uh, between the political developments and the uh, ecclesial developments in the Russian church in the beginning of the 20th century. And uh, I think it's really not a coincidence that the council uh, uh, was able to be convened, it was happened actually in this very, very short period of time of short lived Russian Republic uh, between the two revolutions, the February and the October revolutions. And this was indeed the period of republicanism and the council happened. And I just want to, excuse me for making this self-reference to my talk at your seminar uh, when I suggested that we can use, you know, interchangeable words like republicanism for, for subordinates, for conciliarity. And I think this council, uh, the great council indicates it, it, indicates it well. Uh, and I think it continues as, to some extent uh, to be to run in parallel the two kind of the ecclesiological and the the political concepts like in the in the process of the reception of the great council if you take for instance the modern developments the <clears throat> uh, present developments in the Russian church there is a deep set skepticism about the great council even though they still ser serve you know a lip service to the great council maybe one of the reasons for that is because the the great council <clears throat> initiated the institute or re-established the institute of patriarchate which is crucially important for the modern russian church but still um in the terms of you know of 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 the reception of the of the conciliar mechanisms there is a a, a profound skepticism in the russian church and uh, just another parallel parallel uh, is with the Panorthos Council, which happened in Crete in 2016. I recall very well the exchange between Archbishop Job, who was the press secretary of the council at the time, and Father Nikolai Balashov. Uh, when Archbishop Job said that, well, there is a kind of uh, democratism in the church, and Father Balashov answered to him that there is no democracy in the church. Uh, so I think this kind of exchange reflects the same kind, of this, the same sort of discourses uh, that uh, took place in the during the Great Council when people essentially discussed political agendas and they projected those political agendas. I mean, monarchical and as mm -hmm. uh, as Deki, uh, social democrat, democratic or monarchical constitution agendas uh, to the ecclesial plane, as it were, and. Uh, uh, the, the ecclesiological discussions at that time could not be comprehended, could, could not be perceived correctly without this political background. I wonder what, what would you agree or what would you say about this? Well, two quick comments in, in response, Father Kedil. And of course, in my whole presentation today, there's a lot of resonance with your own work on church structures, uh, because this is what the reformers were talking about. Um, but a couple, a couple of things. First, about the skepticism. There, yes, uh, a, a great part of the legacy of the Great Sabor of 1917-18 uh, is uh, skepticism. Uh, certainly in the emigration, in much neopatristic theology, uh, and in contemporary Russian theology, there remains skepticism about the value of the Sabor because of its political connections or political paradigms that some, some observers felt were at work uh, in it. Um, I, you know, I respond to that skepticism, first of all, in this way, uh, then I'm gonna say something less emotional <laughs> and more rational. Um, it strikes me as a pity that the greatest Orthodox assembly of the second millennium, and there really isn't any question but that the Council of 1917-18 was the greatest Orthodox assembly of the second millennium, it has somehow become a source of skepticism and anxiety uh, uh, in the church. Now, I realize we're talking about a very large event, and we're also talking about now a century's worth of reception, which is also complicated in its own way. So I'm not trying to simplify, but you see what I'm saying. Um, in the first instance, it seems to me 
what the council, the fact that the council happened and what it did uh, it should be um, a beginning point for some kind of joy in the church, some kind of ecclesiastical uh, um, celebration of the church. Uh, but to the point of the political uh, uh, connections, these of course are complicated, but I would throw out, first of all, suggest this one distinction. Um, constitutionalism and democracy. These are not the same thing. They are often associated, uh, including in Russia, the cadet party, the constitutional democratic party of the period between the revolutions. But actually they're not the same thing. The council of 1917-18 examined in terms of the system of government that it instituted uh, could not be convicted of democratism in the church unless one wants to associate participation as such with democracy, but that seems to me to be a false association. Participation is a much broader concept. So we're not really, we really shouldn't accuse the council, either the council itself as an event or the system it legislated of introducing democratism in the church. It's a false notion of democracy and it's a misleading notion of what the council actually was and did. It did, the council, certainly could be said to have instituted a constitutionalism in the church. That seems to me to be fair. The result of the council was a new church constitution. But of course, remember, the Russian church already had a con constitution in 1917. It had the synodal constitution. The only way you can change a constitution is by proposing a new constitution or revising the old one, but that was, a, that was not an option. Proposing a new constitution, unless you know, one wants to take a truly anarchist view and say that you know you could just throw out the Sonoma Constitution and everything would automatically work out well according to some ideal. Um, the council did introduce a constitution. It had to. Uh, and in the complexity of a modern uh, constitutional democratic society, Churches have to have some kind of constitution. It's an essential part of their identity, their self-definition and independence vis-a-vis -vis whatever the political context is in which they find themselves. So I would offer that as, I think, an important distinction that doesn't get talked about enough in Russian church discourse. That is to say, the distinction between constitutionalism on the one hand and democracy on the other. These are not the same thing. And it seems to me that any ecclesial constitutionalism is uh, perfectly possible. Of course, so is ecclesial democracy, but not on the basis of the canons of orthodoxy, which is why the council didn't go in that direction. Um, thank you, Paul. Uh, any questions else? Uh, Irina? Yes, I, I would like to thank Paul for um, this uh, very um, uh, well structured and uh, uh, just you know answering lots of questions uh, pre uh, presentation. So I uh, I have one question about your um, distinction between subordinized uh, uh, as as a reform movement or subordinized that led to sabor and subordinized that didn't lead to sabor. And you 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 gave example of uh, Dmitry Khamenkov. Um, so, um, but uh, going back to the um, original uh, um, concept or original writings by 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 his father by uh, uh, by Khamenkov the Elder. So, w w would you say that uh, Khamenkov the Elder would uh, be also 
not supporting uh, subornist as leading to to sabor so to say so uh, that's just a kind of speculative question because obviously uh, you know speaking about the romantic uh, uh, notion of subornist uh, um, as in Hamikov's writing so we, we will not be able to find any specific suggestions how sh uh, the church should be reformed uh, so I think uh, that that's very um, uh, that's something I, I, I was myself wondering about. And the second question I have, uh, how far do you think um, the ideas of Ivansov, uh, Platonov, and um, those who were writing before uh, 1905, um, how far do you think they were uh, known outside, let's say, you know, Moscow and St. Petersburg, um, uh, you know, in, in the church, uh, do, do, do you think, uh, I don't know how widely this uh, Rusi was uh, actually um, published, I mean, what kind of uh, tirage it had, but what do you think, I mean, would, let's say, ordinary priests uh, somewhere in provincial diocese uh, be aware of, of, of these ideas um, uh, before uh, the reform movement took uh, its toll? You know, after the uh, revolution, even like after 1905, do you think you know yeah, ordinary yeah. priests would be aware of that? So these are my questions. Um, you know, Irina, I really can't answer that question uh, in an expert way. I, I uh, maybe Dan or some of you who have worked uh, more on the historical material than I have. Uh, <clears throat> can help me here, I, <clears throat> I will say this, that um, in the period immediately uh, following 1905, uh, a great deal was republished from some decades earlier. For example, a, a large volume of Giliarov's journalism on church issues was published in oh, like 1906 or 1907 or something like that. And that's just one example. Um, I do not know the publication history as we move forward to, to publishing this material. Uh, that's something I'll have to research myself. I do not know the subsequent publication history of Ivan Sof's work. Um, that's clearly an important question and I just can't answer it. Um, certainly though, among, um, the church intelligentsia, these figures were known, Gilyad of Ivansov, these figures were well known in the church intelligentsia. They were connected themselves with the intelligentsia. Uh, they weren't intelligentsia exactly, but they were connected. Uh, I don't have any doubts on that score, but as for uh, your example, the, the parish priests out in the provinces, I don't know. Chances are not, and yet, we often underestimate just how informed some of these supposedly provincial uh, individuals in Russia actually were. So that would be something that I would have to research more. Um, maybe some of you have. Uh, as for the question about uh, 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 you know, I see, Obviously, it, 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 it's impossible to answer what Khomyakov might have thought if he had lived uh, to see 1905 rather than, uh, or 1906, the, the Preconciliar Commission, rather than his son. Um, we have a seminal thinker who didn't write a whole lot about the ideas we most remember him for. These ideas uh, gave rise to different streams of thought. Uh, that much seems clear. One thing that, that, that is very important about the issue you're raising is um, the neopatristic thinkers of the emigration, the classical, you know, from Florovsky on, the, the classical Russian theologians of the emigration, uh, they were uh, very invested in a view of Pamyakov that uh, did not identify Pamyakovian ecclesiology with the direction of the church reform movement in Russia. 
Um, there are just innumerable examples of this. Florovsky, for example, in Puti Ruskova Bogoslovia, uh, expresses skepticism uh, about the council as imposing a sort of constitutionalism on the church. He uses, he uses that word. And of course, it's interesting in the light of how one reads Homeopoly to uh, examine Florovsky's famous essay, one of the most famous essays he ever wrote, The Catholicity of the Church. Um, some of you know that, the, the, that that essay was first published in English in 1934 in a volume organized uh, uh, in England. And the original title of the essay was Sobornos, the Catholicity of the Church. When Florovsky republished the essay in his collected works in 1972, he removed the term Sobornos and it just became the Catholicity of the Church. And Father Paul Gavriuk, in his uh, recent book on Florovsky, uh, finds uh, found a wonderful uh, um, a wonderful statement by Florovsky. See if I can find it here uh, for you. And I will read it. I have quoted. Uh, in 1967, this is from an archival source that uh, uh, Paul Gavrilou uh, found at Princeton University. Uh, in 1967, in uh, lecture notes, Florovsky writes that he passionately dislikes the term sobornos and that the term catholiki covers all aspects of the term soborni. This is a reading of uh, Homyakov that uh, would steer away from the identity, from the direction that the church reform movement took with the concept of Sobornus, that saw Sobornus as something that wasn't just traditional. It really was a, well, it was a neologism and it was not only a neologism, it was a new idea. In other words, it was, it was an idea with traditional elements in it, but it still was a novum. It was something fresh and something new. Florovsky doesn't want that. He passionately dislikes the term sobornos. Catholiki is sufficient for us. No, that's very, very revealing comment. Uh, so this is a debate that as far as I can see is continuing. This debate continues in Russian theology and. I'm not the best person to referee that, that debate. Thank you, Paul. Uh, I would like to add uh, some words on, uh, on this um, uh, question, uh, Irina's question on Khamikov. Uh, I remember the mention of uh, the, the opinion of uh, Andrzej Walitsky, who wrote that uh, in Khamikov, uh, subordinacy is not parliamentarism. Uh, because uh, the invariably infallible opinion of the whole church is not an uh, arithmetic result of, of the private opinions of all its members taken separately. In order to properly understand uh, Chemikov's uh, ecclesiology, uh, Walitsky wrote, uh, it should be remembered that he understood the freedom of the church uh, not as individual Protestant freedom. Uh, of individual believers, but the freedom of the church as a supra-individual cohesive whole. Uh, and uh, I, I think it, it is very important uh, uh, point of view uh, on Khamikov's uh, ecclesiology. Yes, and um, it is a view consistent with an, a reading of Khamikov that situates him as to use Valitsky's words, a romantic conservative. Yes. A view of the church, which is romantic conservative in its texture. The church critics, uh, it, it, romantic conservatism, strictly speaking, sees an organic reality, which is threatened from outside forces 
and wants to protect it. Uh, the church critics notion of subornus was, was different. They looked for subornus and didn't find it. In other words, they were critical of the reality that they actually saw. They did not see an organic reality that was threatened from the outside. They saw a reality that had been somehow uh, undermined, corrupted, uh, disfigured. And that, that's true, uh, yes. That's true. Um, uh, who would like to ask uh, a question? Um, uh, Father Kirill? Yeah, very briefly. Uh, uh, just as a reaction to your wonderful definition of uh, romantic uh, conservatism, can you identify the same kind of romantic uh, conservative ecclesiology in our days? Well, I don't know. I, I, I guess I, I would be hesitant to do that because I don't, I really haven't thought about that. Um, I would invite you or anyone uh, to, to make suggestions about that. I'm, it's a good question. I'm not sure how I would answer it. Andrei, maybe you have an idea. <laughs> Uh, I think uh, Eucharistic ecclesiology is a good uh, example of romantic conservative. Uh, I'm sorry, Andre, who's? U Eucharistic ecclesiology, Athanasius or Metropolitan John's is Ulysses, uh, because uh, um, they um, uh, think uh, the church as a, some kind of organic whole uh, without uh, individual uh, dimension. Uh, and uh, I, I think it, it, it is a uh, very, very clear uh, lay in these uh, words of Andrzej Walitsky, for example, uh, uh, described Hamekov's uh, uh, understanding of, um, of uh, subornist. And uh, we, we could uh, say um, the same about uh, Afanasyev's uh, uh, understanding of uh, subornist and uh, also uh, on these Ulysses, but that is my uh, my opinion. <laughs> um. I would like to also to um, ask uh, if I may, if there are no, I couldn't find the, um, um, yes, I can see this, there is one hand, uh, but I don't see. Father Andrew, Father Andrews. Father Andrews, uh, right, Andrew. okay. Uh, okay, uh, Father Andrew, please, uh, your question. It's, it's not a question, it's more of a comment. I mean, we, the notion of Slavophil um, being kind of conservative, sorry, romantic conservatives, there, there's a big difference between what's going to be happen, what, what is happening now and what was happening in the 19th century. Romantic conservatism is not just ecclesiology, it's a, it, it's a, it's a political stance. Um, it's, it's, I mean, it, it, it's fairly widespread, it seems to me, in the early part of the 19th century. It's a reaction to, to the um, industrialization of society, the decline of organic, organic society, not in the church, but in, 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 in society as a whole. Um, it's a political stance and it's got, a, it's got ecclesiological uh, implications and it can also feed on ecclesiology. But it seems to me that nowadays ecclesiology is a purely Ecclesiastical phenomenon. It's got. It's. It's not. It's, it's not. It's not at all clear to me in what in what sense it has any kind of uh, real political um, resonances. It's a. It's a, a purely church notion. Yeah, I mean that. That's a very helpful. That, that's a very helpful way to think about it. Um, uh, in your presentation um, uh, six weeks or whenever it was ago, uh, Father Andrew, I also remember you emphasized that uh, the romantic conservatism you were and Balitsky was seeing in Homyakov was a, 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 a pan-European movement. I mean, it wasn't, uh, uh, it, it wasn't isolated. Um, in Russia, you mentioned uh, Coleridge uh, in England, uh, who a good example um, of it, and who was also a very serious churchman. 
um, whether um, you know, whether there's a secular romantic conservatism at work in the world today, I, uh, I don't know. Um, it's conceivable, but obviously under completely different circumstances. Um, in, uh, oh, I think I've said enough on that. I knew it. It's a very helpful, very helpful uh, comment. Thank you. Uh, Irina, please. Uh, so I, I would like maybe to um, have, well, I have a question um, that relates to Paul's book on conciliarism. So I wonder um, uh, how would we, you know, terminologically uh, speak of uh, subordinist? Um, uh, is it uh, just like some kind of um, uh, Russian cultural equivalent of conciliarism or orthodox equivalent of conciliarism or something uh, uh, separate. Uh, so, how would you position, like, what you, what you, how you define conciliarism in church per se, and the subordinist uh, as we know it, or in different of its, uh, you know, hypostasis, so to say. Well, the the beauty of subordinates. Uh, uh, Thomas Bramer is not with us today, I know, because of a conflict, but. Um, uh, he raised the question at our very first event, uh, do we need this concept uh, of subornos? Uh, I've already quoted Florovsky to the effect that we really don't. Um, at least that was Florovsky's view. Uh, it seems to me that the beauty of subornos is it really is um, a single word that's brimful of meaning and association in all directions, ecclesiolo ecclesiologically in particular. It won't work to simply translate subornos as conciliarity. That would be a dim diminishment of the richness of the term. Uh, I think the best translation for subornos into English at least for general purposes, general purposes, because as soon as one starts to talk in more particular terms, one has to introduce additional terms. But I usually translate subornos simply as fellowship, fellowship, which is a very sort of resonant word in English. Uh, but that's, that's my particular choice. Conciliarity or conciliarism would be too narrow a translation of subordinate, even though in a particular context, that could be exactly what it means. Thank you, Paul. Uh, the next question uh, of uh, Dan and then um, uh, Father Andrew. Please. Thanks. Um, I was just in, in reference to the question of how subordinate was being used. I was uh, recall the comment of uh, Yevlogi uh, in his memoirs, Mitropoliti of Logi, where uh, he was uh, describing the missionary council. I can't remember which one. There were a couple of them uh, where he said, we didn't, get a, it wasn't, we didn't get a whole lot done, but it was a great opportunity for subordinate, I think he says. Yeah. And, um, and, and, and what, what had happened at that point was, as, as you point out, the, the, the episcopate was never able to, to meet. And uh, Pabjeda Nostsev, I believe, for this particular council said, discuss only the problem of schism and sectarianism, nothing else. So there was, there's, so I think subordinist was, was much more um, uh, of, uh, was much more of a hot, a hot button issue for the, for the episcopate at this time. Whereas for the parish clergy, they were constantly meeting. And they they had their Yeparchiani uh, Siesdi, and they they had they had their Papichitlistva, and they had they had these these things they were constantly being asked to do, simply to administer the church. And so, uh, well, Irina's paper yesterday was um, maybe says something to your own question of did were the were the parish clergy even aware of this idea of subordinates, were they using it? Because the bishop in Riga called the Eparchiani Siesd, in this case, a sabor. And uh, Allison uh, pointed out yesterday that this, that this was discussed. Uh, some parish clergy uh, were, were making reference to the sabor 
that they had in 1905 in, in Riga. But in my own research, I don't see the, the priests talking about subordinist. But in 1917, when, uh, when the councils become, when the, the diocesan councils become politically uh, significant, what they, what they start talking about a lot more is kananichnast. And they're, they're, they, were, they, were trying to, uh, they were trying to get their own, their own voices to count in, in church governance, but they're also afraid of the narod. They're, they're afraid that, that all authority is going to collapse. And Ragozny, in, in his book on 1917, makes the point that uh, the church is the only institution that remains very intact. And it's, it's kind of remarkable. I think this idea of subordinist is, uh, becomes uh, a word not only for, for uh, greater participation, but also the integrity of the hierarchy and the integrity of the church structure. So I'm, I guess I completely agree with you that this word subordinist is bigger than conciliarity because it means a lot of different things, especially in 1917. Absolutely. Uh, yes, Father Andrew. Well, I just wanted to just, just to, to um, I think one of the, be the beauty of subordinist, but also the weakness of subordinist is that it has so much, so such much, such a wide range of resonance in 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 Russian that it doesn't have any. And to translate to another language, you have to choose. I mean, Saborini in the Creed, I think, is, is my theory is, no, is that it really is an attempt to catch what's what Catholicos really means, derived from the word Catholon, and so taking something all together. But the word it also is it, it's if you want to translate. The, the, the Greek synodos, you would end up with sobor. If you want to translate the Greek synaxis, gathering together in the church to worship, you would use something very like sobor again. Um, and you can translate, you can, you can, you can represent sobornost in English by saying synodality, which is one thing, or conciliarity, which is actually in English sounds very different. Um, but all these things split up in other, in, in other languages, whereas in, in Russian, the word Sobornost holds yeah. together uh, a lot of different different resonances, um, yeah. which also makes it difficult to define because yeah. it means too much. Yeah. But I think that that I mean, I'm not a pro I'm not a, a, a Slavist at all. But it just seems to me that the word Sobornost um, gathers together ideas in a way that no other language does quite in the same way. Yeah. Which is why it should be preserved and celebrated, uh, <laughs> even though, as you say, the many meanings is also one of the reasons why it, it's, it becomes difficult. Yeah, it's difficult to define, but, it's, but it, has, it's got, it, has a, it gathers together resonances that we probably want to keep together. It's the same as Kinonier, as Natalia also says. I think actually there, I think I disagree with you, Paul. I think fellowship, is a very weak translation because fellowship in English is a, is, is a flat notion. We are all fellows together. Whereas I, the, the, the Greek word kinonia means participating together in something else, which fellowship- Father, what, Father Andrew, what would you suggest in English as a, as a, uh, a, a translation for general purposes? Oh, I don't know. I don't think we can. The near, the, I mean, the nearest, I, I would think, Catholicity. Um, but that, of course, has got disadvantages. Yes, thank you. Interesting, very interesting. And Father Kirill, please, you. Just to add to that, uh, and I think etymologically, the word sabor and synodos are quite different. Synodos means those who hit the same road from the word odos, Greek odos, which is a road. Uh, and literally it meant people who use, you know, the system of the Roman roads to get together. Uh, while the Russian sabor, uh, sabor uh, has more to do with uh, gathering together, sabirak. So they are very different uh, indeed words. Yes, thank you. Um, any questions else? Uh, well, 
Paul, thank you for so much. Uh, thank you so much for this brilliant lecture and very fruitful discussion. It's a pity that uh, Thomas Bremer wasn't uh, there today. He could uh, he heard uh, the answer to the question why we need the concept <laughs> of subornist. <laughs> um, uh, I see in it, uh, first of all, a powerful aesthetic potential that uh, can be transformed uh, into both theo aesthetics and uh, political aesthetics. And, uh, um, uh, I look forward for your paper uh, and uh, uh, I'm looking forward to uh, the continue of our seminars uh, and uh, maybe uh, in, the, in the end uh, of our series, um, we, we could uh, uh, understand uh, something about Sabornist. <laughs> Uh, yes. Irina. Yes, I, I would like to just um, maybe for our future seminars to ask uh, um, suggestions um, uh, in very particular area because um, we've uh, mentioned that the um, uh, immigration had expressed this, you know, skepticism about Sabor, but surely not, not uh, entire immigration, you know, speaking of uh, uh, Russian immigration after 1917. I uh, suppose there were um, members of immigration that were very enthusiastic about Sabor and Sabornest, uh, you know, and um, maybe we need to learn a little bit more about uh, these different strengths of, uh, let's say, Sabor legacy and Sabornest legacy, you know, in, um, in the 20th century, uh, because we, we know quite a bit about Florovsky now, about new patristics, but maybe uh, somebody could uh, speak about other um, kind of legacies. So I wonder if um, maybe some of members today could uh, bring up the names of people who do research on that. Uh, that would be very interesting um, from my point of view. Uh, but this is just um, a proposal which we could uh, I, I invite everybody, you know, to send us emails and um, um, give your suggestions for future speakers and uh, the recording of this uh, uh, webinar will be available and um, we hope to see as many of you as possible in our next uh, webinar so thank you very much for being with us today so thank you paul thank you thank, thank you, you all thank you all for for coming and please write me with your comments and particularly your criticisms um we'd love to hear from you well we have to uh digest <laughs> uh, all this information and think about it so thank you very much so keep well bye bye